let's ask the really big question. The question that drives all other questions. What is the key to life? What do we live for? How do we live well? At a funeral, when this earthly life is done, how do we weigh someone's life? What is the point? What is the key to life? Uh, You might hear that question and answer it with something like being a good person. Or maybe it's family. That's the most important thing when all is said and done. You might think that leaving a legacy of money or some good cause, that is the key to a life well lived. Well, the book of Proverbs says that the key to life is wisdom. And as such, we must start this little mini-series with a good, solid definition of what wisdom actually is. And the opening words of this book, this collection, they help us do that. You see, if we were to break into this book uh, almost at random, you would quickly become disheartened. The book of Proverbs quickly becomes more than we can handle in one sitting. Instead, this is a collection worth taking slowly. And the introduction gives us this approach. It sets the expectations for us, the readers, to know what to look for and how to look for it. So today we take these seven verses at the beginning and we orientate ourselves to this book. And we'll hear about a number of characteristics. There's discipline, insight, wisdom, prudence, knowledge, discretion, learning, and of course, a fear of the Lord. Uh, Firstly, though, we must identify why we need a book like this, why we need wisdom at all. The why of this is our own foolishness, our foolish nature, and that's as old as the garden. Uh, When Adam and Eve made their mistake, it was because they wanted wisdom. They wanted the knowledge of good and evil. But the reality was that this was perhaps the most foolish thing that ever happened. Uh, Nancy Guthrie says this, when they chose to disobey God's prohibition, thinking it would make them wise, it actually turned our race into fools. Foolishness became the default setting for every child ever born. This is the rub. We tend towards folly. We can say the wrong thing, the wrong way, at the wrong time. We can do the wrong thing. We spend our money poorly. We can stay in unhealthy relationships. We put ourselves in dangerous situations and then we stay there, we linger there. Fools rush in. And in it all, we seldom listen to others. Now thankfully, God will not leave us there. He won't leave us in this foolish state. And so in this book, you'll hear wisdom call. Uh, If you glance at 1, 20 and 21, you'll see the first instance of this. This is our introduction to lady wisdom. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out at the city gate. She makes her speech. Wisdom is not something that we gain at a quiet retreat or through endless meditation. It does not come from within us, but from outside of us, God. His wisdom, which is pictured in Proverbs here as a wise, compassionate lady, this is what we need. And she calls out. And she calls out loudly. It's in public. She calls from atop the walls at the city gates where all the important decisions were made. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out at the city gate. She makes her speech. This is help for ordinary people. Not the few, the wise sages of history. God's grace and God's wisdom are never for the few or the elite. They are for the ordinary, which is to say they are for us, the confused, the bewildered, the defeated, the proud, and the broken. 
Uh, C.S. Lewis once wrote a book called Pilgrim's Regress. In that, he says that the path to wisdom goes through a valley. And he says this, we call it now simply wisdom's valley. But the oldest maps mark it as the valley of humiliation. There's the way to wisdom. We are required to listen to its call and listen humbly. Uh, Put it another way, Proverbs will teach us that we have never really thought about anything enough. Uh, Tim Keller says, if the Bible were a medicine cabinet, Psalms would be the ointment to put on inflamed skin to calm and heal it. Proverbs would be more like smelling salts to startle you into being alert. In a new era in which the government tells us to be alert, God actually tells us the same, but in a very different mode. We're not to just be alert, whatever that means, but alert to God and his wisdom, his teaching. Uh, Verse 1 of Proverbs here actually tells us this very subtly. It says this, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. You see, mention of Solomon there points us not to someone who was naturally wise, but the gift of wisdom that he received. If you know your Bible, you'll know that Solomon prayed for this in 1 Kings 3. Let me read that to you. He says, Now, Lord my God, you've made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child, and I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Imagine if someone like Boris Johnson got on his knees and prayed something like that. Solomon's wisdom was not a character quality. It's not that something he possessed all by himself. He didn't work it up. Solomon's wisdom was supernatural. It was God-given. Wisdom comes from God. So what is it then? What is wisdom? Well, it's one of those things, one of those character qualities that everyone wants, but few are willing to work for. Uh, What follows in chapter 1 here is a list of words that scare many people. Uh, Thomas Edison once said, Opportunity is missed by people because it is dressed in overalls and it looks like work. Uh, Wisdom, you see, is more than just being quick-minded. It's more than just someone trying to be a good person. It's not the same as being smart. There are plenty of smart people who have no common sense. God's wisdom is skill in living. But living is a complicated business. I'm sure you've found that. So we don't just need good advice or good examples in a book. We need what it says. We need, we need proverbs. The proverb is not just the, the contents of this collection. It's not just proverbs bunched together. It's also the method of the book. It's how we learn. Uh, Let me be clear, before we head into these sayings, puzzles, parables, and proverbs, this is more than learned common sense. A biblical proverb is a little world, a little universe. And we must enter it and look around it and absorb it. And then we can start to come to some understanding or lesson. There's learning to do here. And that is always work. And it's always the work of learners, what we have come in the church to call disciples. If the world says to us, you live and you learn, then the Bible says you learn and you live. Well, what's ahead of us then? Well, if learning is done by learners, disciples, then it seems right to start with discipline. Uh, We'll hear here that Proverbs are for gaining wisdom and instruction. 
Uh, discipline is hiding behind our English word instruction. We are to admit that we need it. We need instructing. We don't know everything. We need to be taught. Now, there's a hard way to wisdom here. It's what Lewis called humiliation. But embracing that means we can be tutored by the best and the brightest, God himself. So let's not fear discipline here, since elsewhere we read of its loving intention. If we're the learners in need of learning, then God is the supreme tutor, not because he knows everything, but because he loves us. Uh, you'll know Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Isn't that lovely? In case we think of this as a very Old Testament way of thinking, we hear the same clear message in Hebrews 12. Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. The Our Father of the Lord's model prayer is at play there. We must pray it. And take it seriously. We must take God seriously. This is the discipline of the Christian life. Uh, also coming up on these pages is insight. These words are for understanding words of insight. Uh, this is the ability to see what's really going on in a situation or in life. Oh, how we would crave insight in 2020. But who knows all, who sees all that is done, and understands it. God does. And he imparts this gift of insight to his people. Uh, you'll know of people who are incredibly insightful. They cut through all the rubbish to the heart of the matter. And Proverbs promises us that these are not unusual people. They're not special, but they're gifted. They're gifted by God. We can learn insight from the one who understands everything clearly. Uh, there's also wisdom, obviously. What we refer to as wisdom is really wise living, wise dealing with others. It's the action of wisdom, not just the knowledge. And it listens and it learns. It learns and it listens. And it lives in a way that navigates life in a fallen world. Folks, living as we do in a sinful world, surrounded by sinful people, including ourselves, we have to know what we're dealing with. The reality of sin must be part of this picture. And to believe that people are inherently good is to be foolish. We do this with other people, then we're somehow shocked when we see them fall spectacularly from grace because of some sin. Uh, we do it with our children. My goodness, aren't they cute? Aren't they innocent? Aren't they good? No, they're not. Have you met children? They can be incredibly cruel. They are often unthinking. And they can be foolish in ways that simply dumbfound us. Proverbs, or I should say at this point, God will school us in the real life application of wisdom in a fallen world full of fallen people. Now, I don't want you to think of that as a bleak thought. That is good news because you will bump into people like this all the time. I don't think there can be any doubt about that this week. From the murders and riots in the States to the selfish crowds on Helens Bay Beach, I don't think I've ever believed in total depravity more and as a result, I don't get depressed. As a result, I have never needed the gospel of Jesus more. That is good news for us. Prudence is here as well. I don't think of the Beatles. 
Prudence is here all by itself. These words are for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple. Uh, prudence is an old-fashioned way of saying shrewdness. Uh, what we're looking at is looking ahead. That is the ability we see here, the ability to see a little bit into the future and see the consequences of choices. Uh, think of something like the Prudential Building Society. It looks ahead. It tries to make good choices. And what prudence does then is it moves us from the immediate instant gratifications that we might chase and it puts our gaze into the future. Let me tell you folks, that is increasingly unusual. Uh, we live in an instant gratification culture. To be millennial is to think only about the here and the now. To be secular is to never think about tomorrow or the future. And put together then, that creates people who live with no thought of heaven or hell or any sense of God. The church must be different. A people who constantly look ahead to kingdom come and so live accordingly. Now, we can't just turn that on. We will slip into the here and the now. We have to learn this. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful to be thought prudent? But how much better to point people to God because our prudence always looks ahead to an eternity with him. Knowledge is one of those words that we think we understand until we're asked to define it. It is so widespread that to ask someone what is knowledge is to invite an almost endless answer. But Proverbs promises knowledge here, knowledge and discretion to the young. And remember, wisdom is not the same as being smart. So we're talking here about more than just facts. Knowledge in the Bible is real knowing. And real knowing is an internalization of God's ways. His words become part of us. His way becomes our way. And that's because we live in his world. We should redefine knowledge this way especially in the church, since this is what God says it is. Uh, perhaps the best way to picture it is in a marriage or a very close friendship. Uh, take Joanne and me. Married for a while now, and we increasingly find ourselves thinking and sometimes saying the same things. I mean exactly the same words. Now, what is that? What is going on there? It's knowing it's real knowing. Because knowing Joanne means that I carry her with me wherever I go. As I meet a situation or a problem, I'll know what Joanne might do or say or what she might think. And it works the same way for her, dear lover. Now that is knowledge. So when I challenged us last week to read our Bibles, it wasn't a rebuke. It wasn't to make us feel bad. It was a wise invitation to think God's thoughts after him. And folks, to do that is real knowledge. That's really knowing God. Because wisdom is revealed by God. He invites us to know him and so become increasingly like him. Imagine the joy of knowing what God would think or say about any situation or difficulty we might face. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We uh, outsource this to our ministers. It's for everybody. It's for everybody. It's not beyond you. It is a gift. It is the gift of God's wisdom and it's contained in his word and his son, Jesus. All of these Wisdoms, you see, are fulfilled in Jesus, the wisest teacher who ever lived and the most loving teacher who ever lived. What an offer. Uh, what else is here? In verses five and six, it says this. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. Let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Uh, two little aspects here. One is that we never stop learning. 
Uh, I'm a member of the Lifelong Learning Club. The day we stop learning is the day they put us in the box. Wisdom keeps going. It keeps learning. The learner is always learning. And notice in the line that the wise listen and add to their learning. And also that the discerning get guidance. This is another uh, facet of real wisdom. It sees through what is false. It discerns what is real and it resists what is wrong. Uh, essentially, to be discerning is the person who cannot be fooled. Now, more to come on foolishness in the next few weeks. It's quite a list, isn't it? It'd be easy at this point to become overwhelmed by it all. Like the first day of term, when all the assignments and homeworks are handed out, and this mountain of work seems insurmountable. Well, thank goodness then for verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is our pole star, our true north, our orientation in all of our learning. It's God himself. And it's also the motto of this whole book of Proverbs. I'm sure many of us have heard this verse. It's one of those well-known lines of scripture. But what does it really mean? Well, this is how we get to wisdom. Fear is not fear, it's awe. It's awe before God. And that's connected to the word beginning. Beginning is more than just the start of a journey. It's about the relationship with God, one of awe and admiration, what we might call worship or praise. And so that relationship is the foundation, the beginning for all the learning that should follow. It goes back to our new definition of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. A relationship with God is the way we know Really, knowing God is key. But the, the converse is also worth noting. The, the whole verse matters. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Despise is a strong word, isn't it? This is not someone who's indifferent to God's word and wisdom, but they hate it. They despise it and therefore despise him. Now, these two ideas, they inform one another, two sides of one coin, and they leave us with a clear choice at the very beginning of this journey. We can humbly accept that we are the simple and God is the wise, or we can think we know better and shun his will and his presence in our world and our lives. We could put it this way. I am not the measure of all things. I am being measured. The uh, early church lived this way collectively. So if you were to slip into thinking individually here, listen to the lived out experience of the church as they feared the Lord. In Acts 9, we read these words, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. This is what a real relationship with God produces. If you've made it this far, you're thinking maybe, great, so what? What do we do with this? Why would we embark on this journey of faith and deepening wisdom? Why would we listen to any of this? Because this isn't abstract. This wisdom took form in our world. It didn't just call to us but it came to us. You see, the word that was with God, that was God, was the wisdom that is Jesus Christ. Uh, do you know, Ray Ortland uh, has said this much better than me, so I'll let him conclude this morning. If you would like to experience God with this humility, here's how you can. You look at the cross. You see a wise man hanging there, dying in the place of fools like you because he loves you. You may despise him, but he doesn't despise you. You may be above him, but he humbled himself for you. Look there, Adam. Look, look away from yourself. Look at him and keep looking at him 
until your pride melts. You will not only worship, you'll begin to grow wise. Well, let's pray about these things. Father God, we so want to be wise, but we often lack the will to listen and learn from you. We prefer quick fixes and shortcuts. So teach us today that we need you. Your way is better and you graciously call to us. Help us hear and follow and be wise just as Jesus was wise. We ask in his name. Amen.